Chapter Six of She. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. She by H. Rider Haggard. Chapter Six: An Early Christian Ceremony. Next morning, at the earliest light of dawn, we rose, performed such ablutions as circumstances would allow, and generally made ready to start. I am bound to say that when there was sufficient light to enable us to see each other's faces, I, for one, burst out into a roar of laughter. Job's fat and comfortable countenance was swollen out to nearly twice its natural size from mosquito bites and Leo's condition was not much better. Indeed, of the three I had come off much the best, probably owing to the toughness of my dark skin and to the fact that a good deal of it was covered by hair, for since we had started from England I had allowed my naturally luxuriant beard to grow at its own sweet will. But the other two were, comparatively speaking, clean-shaved, which of course gave the enemy a larger extent of open country to operate on, though in Mohammed's case the mosquitoes, recognising the taste of a true believer, would not touch him at any price. How often, I wonder, during the next week or so did we wish that we were flavoured like an Arab. By the time that we had done laughing as heartily as our swollen lips would allow, it was daylight and the morning breeze was coming up from the sea, cutting lanes through the dense marsh mists, and here and there rolling them before it in great balls of fleecy vapour. So we set our sail, and having first taken a look at the two dead lions and the alligator, which we were of course unable to skin, being destitute of means of curing the pelts, we started, and sailing through the lagoon followed the course of the river on the farther side. At midday, when the breeze dropped, we were fortunate enough to find a convenient piece of dry land on which to camp and light a fire, and here we cooked two wild ducks and some of the water-buck's flesh, not in a very appetising way, it is true, but still sufficiently. The rest of the buck's flesh we cut into strips and hung in the sun to dry into biltong, as I believe the South African Dutch call flesh thus prepared. On this welcome patch of dry land we stopped till the following dawn, and as before spent the night in warfare with the mosquitoes, but without other troubles. The next day or two passed in similar fashion, and without noticeable adventures, except that we shot a specimen of a peculiarly graceful hornless buck, and saw many varieties of water-lily in full bloom, some of them blue and of exquisite beauty, though few of the flowers were perfect owing to the prevalence of a white water-maggot with a green head that fed upon them. It was on the fifth day of our journey, when we had travelled, so far as we could reckon, about one hundred and thirty-five to a hundred and forty miles westwards from the coast, that the first event of any real importance occurred. On that morning the usual wind failed us about eleven o'clock, and after pulling a little way we were forced to halt, more or less exhausted, at what appeared to be the junction of our stream with another of a uniform width of about fifty feet. Some trees grew near at hand, the only trees in all this country were along the banks of the river, and under these we rested, and then, the land being fairly dry just here, walked a little way along the edge of the river to prospect, and shoot a few waterfowl for food. Before we had gone fifty yards we perceived that all hopes of getting further up the stream in the whale-boat were at an end, for not two hundred yards above where we had stopped were a succession of shallows and mud-banks, with not six inches of water over them. It was a watery cul-de-sac. Turning back, we walked some way along the banks of the other river, and soon came to the conclusion, from various indications, that it was not a river at all, but an ancient canal, 
like the one which is to be seen above Mombasa on the Zanzibar coast, connecting the Tana River with the Ozi, in such a way as to enable the shipping coming down the Tana to cross to the Ozi and reach the sea by it, and thus avoid the very dangerous bar that blocks the mouth of the Tana. The canal before us had evidently been dug out by man at some remote period of the world's history, and the results of his digging still remained in the shape of the raised banks that had no doubt once formed towing paths. Except here and there where they had been hollowed out by the water or fallen in, these banks of stiff binding clay were at a uniform distance from each other, and the depth of the stream also appeared to be uniform. Current there was little or none, and, as a consequence, the surface of the canal was choked with vegetable growth, intersected by little paths of clear water, made, I suppose, by the constant passage of waterfowl, iguanas, and other vermin. Now, as it was evident that we could not proceed up the river, it became equally evident that we must either try the canal or else return to the sea. We could not stop where we were to be baked by the sun and eaten up by the mosquitoes till we died of fever in that dreary marsh. "'Well, I suppose that we must try it,' I said, and the others assented in their various ways. Leo, as though it were the best joke in the world, Job in respectful disgust, and Mohammed with an invocation to the Prophet, and a comprehensive curse upon all unbelievers and their ways of thought and travel. Accordingly, as soon as the sun got low, having little or nothing more to hope for from our friendly wind, we started. For the first hour or so we managed to row the boat, though with great labour, but after that the weeds got too thick to allow of it, and we were obliged to resort to the primitive and most exhausting resource of towing her. For two hours we laboured, Mohammed, Job, and I, who was supposed to be strong enough to pull against the two of them, on the bank, while Leo sat in the bow of the boat and brushed away the weeds which collected round the cutwater with Mohammed's sword. At dark we halted for some hours to rest and enjoy the mosquitoes, but about midnight we went on again, taking advantage of the comparative cool of the night. At dawn we rested for three hours and then started once more and laboured on till about ten o'clock, when a thunderstorm accompanied by a deluge of rain overtook us and we spent the next six hours practically under water. I do not know that there is any necessity for me to describe the next four days of our voyage in detail, further than to say that they were, on the whole, the most miserable that I ever spent in my life, forming one monotonous record of heavy labour, heat, misery, and mosquitoes. All that dreary way we passed through a region of almost endless swamp, and I can only attribute our escape from fever and death to the constant doses of quinine and purgatives which we took, and the unceasing toil which we were forced to undergo. On the third day of our journey up the canal we had sighted a round hill that loomed dimly through the vapours of the marsh, and on the evening of the fourth night, when we camped, this hill seemed to be within five and twenty or thirty miles of us. We were by now utterly exhausted, and felt as though our blistered hands could not pull the boat a yard farther, and that the best thing that we could do would be to lie down and die in that dreadful wilderness of swamp. It was an awful position, and one in which I trust no other white man will ever be placed. And as I threw myself down in the boat to sleep the sleep of utter exhaustion, I bitterly cursed my folly in ever having been a party to such a mad undertaking, which could, I saw, only end in our death in this ghastly land. I thought, I remember, as I slowly sank into a doze, of what the appearance of the boat and her unhappy crew would be in two or three months' time from that night. There she would lie, with gaping seams, and half filled with fetid water, 
which, when the mist-laden wind stirred her, would wash backwards and forwards through our mouldering bones, and that would be the end of her and of those in her who would follow after myths and seek out the secrets of nature. Already I seemed to hear the water rippling against the desiccated bones and rattling them together, rolling my skull against Mohammed's and his against mine, till at last Mohammed stood straight up upon its vertebrae and glared at me through its empty eye-holes and cursed me with its grinning jaws, because I, a dog of a Christian, disturbed the last sleep of a true believer. I opened my eyes and shuddered at the horrid dream, and then shuddered again at something that was not a dream, for two great eyes were gleaming down at me through the misty darkness. I struggled up, and in my terror and confusion shrieked and shrieked again, so that the others sprang up too, reeling and drunken with sleep and fear. And then all of a sudden there was a flash of cold steel, and a great spear was held against my throat, and behind it other spears gleamed cruelly. Peace, said a voice speaking in Arabic, or rather in some dialect into which Arabic entered very largely. Who are ye who come hither swimming on the water? Speak, or ye die. And the steel pressed sharply against my throat, sending a cold chill through me. "'We are travellers, and have come hither by chance,' I answered in my best Arabic, which appeared to be understood, for the man turned his head, and addressing a tall form that towered up in the background, said, "'Father, shall we slay?' "'What is the colour of the men?' said a deep voice in answer. "'White is their colour. "'Slay not,' was the reply. Four sons since was the word brought to me from she who must be obeyed. White men come. If white men come, slay them not. Let them be brought to the house of she who must be obeyed. Bring forth the men, and let that which they have with them be brought forth also. Come, said the man, half leading and half dragging me from the boat, and as he did so I perceived other men doing the same kind office to my companions. On the bank were gathered a company of some fifty men. In that light all I could make out was that they were armed with huge spears, were very tall and strongly built, comparatively light in colour, and nude save for a leopard skin tied round the middle. Presently Leo and Job were bundled out and placed beside me, "'What on earth is up?' said Leo, rubbing his eyes. "'Oh, Lord, sir, here's a rum go,' ejaculated Job, and just at that moment a disturbance ensued, and Mohammed came tumbling between us, followed by a shadowy form with an uplifted spear. "'Allah! Allah!' howled Mohammed, feeling that he had little to hope from man. "'Protect me! Protect me!' "'Father, it is a black one,' said a voice. "'What said she who must be obeyed about the black one?' "'She said naught, but slay him not. "'Come hither, my son.' "'The man advanced, and the tall shadowy form bent forward and whispered something. "'Yes, yes,' said the other, and chuckled in a rather blood-curdling tone. "'Are the three white men there?' asked the form. "'Yes, they are there.' "'Then bring up that which is made ready for them, "'and let the men take all that can be brought from the thing which floats.' Hardly had he spoken when men came running up, carrying on their shoulders neither more nor less than palanquins, four bearers and two spare men to a palanquin, and in these it was promptly indicated we were expected to stow ourselves. Well, said Leo, it is a blessing to find anybody to carry us after having to carry ourselves so long. Leo always takes a cheerful view of things. 
There being no help for it, after seeing the others into theirs, I tumbled into my own litter, and very comfortable I found it. It appeared to be manufactured of cloth woven from grass fibre, which stretched and yielded to every motion of the body, and, being bound top and bottom to the bearing pole, gave a grateful support to the head and neck. Scarcely had I settled myself when, accompanying their steps with a monotonous song, the bearers started at a swinging trot. For half an hour or so I lay still, reflecting on the very remarkable experiences that we were going through, and wondering if any of my eminently respectable fossil friends down at Cambridge would believe me if I were to be miraculously set at the familiar dinner-table for the purpose of relating them. I do not want to convey any disrespectful notion or slight when I call these good and learned men fossils, but my experience is that people are apt to fossilise even at a university if they follow the same paths too persistently. I was getting fossilised myself, but of late my stock of ideas has been very much enlarged. Well, I lay and reflected and wondered what on earth would be the end of it all, till at last I ceased to wonder, and went to sleep. I suppose I must have slept for seven or eight hours, getting the first real rest that I had had since the night before the loss of the Tao, for when I woke the sun was high in the heavens. We were still journeying on at a pace of about four miles an hour. Peeping out through the mist-like curtains of the litter, which were ingeniously fixed to the bearing-pole, I perceived to my infinite relief that we had passed out of the region of eternal swamp, and were now travelling over swelling grassy plains towards a cup-shaped hill. Whether or not it was the same hill that we had seen from the canal I do not know, and have never since been able to discover, for, as we afterwards found out, these people will give little information upon such points. Next I glanced at the men who were bearing me. They were of a magnificent build, few of them being under six feet in height, and yellowish in colour. Generally their appearance had a good deal in common with that of the East African Somali, only their hair was not frizzed up, but hung in thick black locks upon their shoulders. Their features were aquiline, and in many cases exceedingly handsome, the teeth being especially regular and beautiful. But notwithstanding their beauty, it struck me that, on the whole, I had never seen a more evil-looking set of faces. There was an aspect of cold and sullen cruelty stamped upon them that revolted me, and which in some cases was almost uncanny in its intensity. Another thing that struck me about them was that they never seemed to smile. Sometimes they sang the monotonous song of which I have spoken, but when they were not singing they remained almost perfectly silent, and the light of a laugh never came to brighten their sombre and evil countenances. Of what race could these people be? Their language was a bastard Arabic, and yet they were not Arabs. I was quite sure of that. For one thing, they were too dark, or rather yellow. I could not say why, but I know that their appearance filled me with a sick fear of which I felt ashamed. While I was still wondering, another litter came up alongside of mine. In it, for the curtains were drawn, sat an old man, clothed in a whitish robe made apparently from coarse linen, that hung loosely about him, who, I at once jumped to the conclusion, was the shadowy figure that had stood on the bank and been addressed as father. He was a wonderful-looking old man, with a snowy beard, so long that the ends of it hung over the sides of the litter, and he had a hooked nose above which flashed out a pair of eyes as keen as a snake's, while his whole countenance was instinct with a look of wise and sardonic humour, impossible to describe on paper. "'Art thou awake, stranger?' he said in a deep and low voice. 
"'Surely, my father,' I answered courteously, feeling certain that I should do well to conciliate this ancient mammon of unrighteousness. He stroked his beautiful white beard, and smiled faintly. "'From whatever country thou camest,' he said, and by the way it must be from one where somewhat of our language is known, they teach their children courtesy there, my stranger son. And now wherefore comest thou unto this land, which scarce an alien foot has pressed from the time that man knoweth? Art thou and those with thee weary of life? We came to find new things, I answered boldly. We are tired of the old things. We have come up out of the sea to know that which is unknown. We are of a brave race who fear not death, my very much respected father. That is, if we can get a little information before we die. Hm, said the old gentleman. That may be true. It is rash to contradict. Otherwise I should say that thou wast lying, my son. However, I dare to say that she who must be obeyed will meet thy wishes in the matter. Who is she who must be obeyed? I asked curiously. The old man glanced at the bearers, and then answered with a little smile that somehow sent my blood to my heart, "'Surely, my stranger son, thou wilt learn soon enough, if it be her pleasure to see thee at all in the flesh.' "'In the flesh?' I answered. "'What may my father wish to convey?' But the old man only laughed a dreadful laugh, and made no reply. "'What is the name of my father's people?' I asked. "'The name of my people is Amahaga, the people of the rocks. "'And if a son might ask, what is the name of my father?' "'My name is Bilali. "'And whither go we, my father?' "'Thou shalt see.' "'And at a sign from him his bearers started forward at a run "'till they reached the litter in which Job was reposing, "'with one leg hanging over the side. "'Apparently, however, he could not make much out of Job, "'for presently I saw his bearers trot forward to Leo's litter. "'And after that, as nothing fresh occurred, "'I yielded to the pleasant swaying motion of the litter "'and went to sleep again. "'I was dreadfully tired.' When I woke I found that we were passing through a rocky defile of a lava formation with precipitous sides, in which grew many beautiful trees and flowering shrubs. Presently this defile took a turn, and a lovely sight unfolded itself to my eyes. Before us was a vast cup of green from four to six miles in extent in the shape of a Roman amphitheatre. The sides of this great cup were rocky and clothed with bush, but the centre was of the richest meadowland, studded with single trees of magnificent growth, and watered by meandering brooks. On this rich plain grazed herds of goats and cattle, but I saw no sheep. At first I could not imagine what this strange spot could be, but presently it flashed upon me that it must represent the crater of some long-extinct volcano, which had afterwards been a lake, and was ultimately drained in some unexplained way. And here I may state that from my subsequent experience of this and a much larger but otherwise similar spot, which I shall have occasion to describe by and by, I have every reason to believe that this conclusion was correct. What puzzled me, however, was that, although there were people moving about herding the goats and cattle, I saw no signs of any human habitation. Where did they all live, I wondered? My curiosity was soon destined to be gratified. Turning to the left, the string of litters followed the cliffy sides of the crater for a distance of about half a mile, or perhaps a little less, and then halted. Seeing the old gentleman, my adopted father, Bilali, emerge from his litter, I did the same, and so did Leo and Job. 
The first thing I saw was our wretched Arab companion, Mohammed, lying exhausted on the ground. It appeared that he had not been provided with a litter, but had been forced to run the entire distance, and as he was already quite worn out when we started, his condition now was one of great prostration. On looking round, we discovered that the place where we had halted was a platform in front of the mouth of a great cave, and piled upon this platform were the entire contents of the whale-boat, even down to the oars and sail. Round the cave stood groups of the men who had escorted us, and other men of a similar stamp. They were all tall and all handsome, though they varied in their degree of darkness of skin, some being as dark as Mohammed, and some as yellow as a Chinese. They were naked except for the leopard skin round the waist, and each of them carried a huge spear. There were also some women among them who, instead of the leopard skin, wore a tanned hide of a small red buck, something like that of the oribe, only rather darker in colour. These women were, as a class, exceedingly good-looking, with large dark eyes, well-cut features, and a thick bush of curling hair, not crisped like a negro's, ranging from black to chestnut in hue, with all shades of intermediate colour. Some, but very few of them, wore a yellowish linen garment, such as I have described as worn by Bilali, but this, as we afterwards discovered, was a mark of rank rather than an attempt at clothing. For the rest, their appearance was not quite so terrifying as that of the men, and they sometimes, though rarely, smiled. As soon as we had alighted, they gathered round us and examined us with curiosity, but without excitement. Leo's tall athletic form and clear-cut Grecian face, however, evidently excited their attention, and when he politely lifted his hat to them and showed his curling yellow hair, there was a slight murmur of admiration. Nor did it stop there, for after regarding him critically from head to foot, the handsomest of the young women, one wearing a robe and with hair of a shade between brown and chestnut, deliberately advanced to him, and in a way that would have been winning had it not been so determined, quietly put her arm round his neck, bent forward, and kissed him on the lips. I gave a gasp, expecting to see Leo instantly speared, and Job ejaculated, The hussy! Well, I never! As for Leo, he looked slightly astonished, and then, remarking that we had clearly got into a country where they followed the customs of the early Christians, deliberately returned the embrace. Again I gasped, thinking that something would happen, but to my surprise, though some of the young women showed traces of vexation, the older ones and the men only smiled slightly. When we came to understand the customs of this extraordinary people, the mystery was explained. It then appeared that, in direct opposition to the habits of almost every other savage race in the world, women among the Amahaga are not only upon terms of perfect equality with the men, but are not held to them by any binding ties. Descent is traced only through the line of the mother, and while individuals are as proud of a long and superior female ancestry as we are of our families in Europe, they never pay attention to or even acknowledge any man as their father, even when their male parentage is perfectly well known. There is but one titular male parent of each tribe, or as they call it, household, and he is its elected and immediate ruler with the title of father. For instance, the man Bilali was the father of this household, which consisted of about 7,000 individuals all told, and no other man was ever called by that name. When a woman took a fancy to a man, she signified her preference by advancing and embracing him publicly, in the same way that this handsome and exceedingly prompt young lady, who was called Ustane, had embraced Leo. 
If he kissed her back, it was a token that he accepted her, and the arrangement continued until one of them wearied of it. I am bound, however, to say that the change of husbands was not nearly so frequent as might have been expected. Nor did quarrels arise out of it, at least among the men, who, when their wives deserted them in favour of a rival, accepted the whole thing much as we accept the income tax or our marriage laws, as something not to be disputed, and as tending to the good of the community, however disagreeable they may in particular instances prove to the individual. It is very curious to observe how the customs of mankind on this matter vary in different countries, making morality an affair of latitude, and what is right and proper in one place, wrong and improper in another. It must, however, be understood that, since all civilized nations appear to accept it as an axiom that ceremony is the touchstone of morality, there is, even according to our canons, nothing immoral about this Amahaga custom, seeing that the interchange of the embrace answers to our ceremony of marriage, which, as we know, justifies most things. End of chapter 6 Recording by Graham Redmond.